Amen, body of believers. How's everybody? Are we good? Amen. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm just excited about this, what we're going to dig into today. And so I uh, want to just jump into it, but first we need to go to the Lord in prayer. Because without the Holy Spirit coming and illuminating these scriptures, without him opening your heart and your eyes, I'm just going to be speaking words to you. So we need God to open our hearts to receive his truth. So let's just, let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, on the righteousness of Jesus Christ, God, we are coming to you, God. God, longing for your presence, God, to just fill us, Lord, as we look at your word that you inspired men to write for us, for our sake, for our edification, for correction, reproof, that we may be complete, Lord. So, God, just we, we just want understanding, Lord. We want to see you clearer. God, we want to fall more in love, Lord. So open our hearts to receive your truth, God, that we may know your love, not just in a cognitive sense, God, but that we may know it in our heart, the seat of our most inner emotion, God, that we may experience you who you are. Lord God, it is your love. It is your love that is so great. It is your Lord, your love that has transformed us. So God, I pray that you just touch my brothers and sisters today. God, show them your face. God, make them more aware of your love and who you are. God, it is you. I'm incomplete in myself, God. It is only you that can carry words to places, those secret places, those burdens that we're carrying, those trials. God, only you can carry it there. So God, I pray that you just touch my brothers and sisters today. Show them more of who you are in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The topic of today, Fernando, as I told you earlier, is how do I know that God loves me? That's our topic. And I'll, I'll tell you how I got there. I recently had a conversation with a, with a person that is very dear to me. They asked me an important question. This is a believer. And the question was about God's love. And this person asked me, how do I know that God loves me? That was the question this person asked me. How do I know that God loves me? And if there is a question to be asked, I believe it should be that one. I believe that's an important question for us all to consider. How do I know that God loves me? Because it is the, it is the love of God that fuels the believer to keep going forward. It's the love of God that, that moves upon the believer to keep going through as we fight these battles of life, as we go through different trials. So if there's a question to be asked, I think that's a good one. How do I know that God loves me? We need to know this. It's a fuel. And, and, and one of the scriptures that, that comes to mind when I think about that is, is 2 Corinthians 5. 14 through 15. This is not our main text, but I just want to show you some. So just go there briefly. Our main text will be Romans 5, 5, but I, I just kind of want to set this up based on this question that I was asked, a very thought-provoking question. How do I know that God loves me? That is the question that we should be asking. And I think Paul kind of gives us a reason why this is an important question, and he shows how in these verses, how love is the fuel that should be driving us. So in 2 Corinthians 5, 14, look what Paul says here. He says, for the love of Christ, for the love of Christ, what does it do? It controls us. Having concluded this. That one died for all, therefore all died in verse 15. And he died for all so that they who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. So Paul is saying in these verses that the love of Christ controls us. That word control in the Greek, it means to compress. 
It means to, to squeeze together with a grip. So he's saying that this love of God, it, is, it has constrained him. It has controlled his whole being. That is why he's on mission. That is why he's in ministry. That is why he's going forward because this love of God has gripped him tightly. It has compressed him. And so this love is, is, is moving in him. But when he says the love of God, I, I begin to think to myself, what love of God is he talking about? Because when Christ was here on the earth, he demonstrated his love in many ways. The love of God, the love of Christ was demonstrated through the healing of the blind. That was the love of God. The love of God was demonstrated through the raising of the dead, Lazarus. The love of God was demonstrated through the feeding of the multitude in, in, in many ways. So it, there was many ways that Christ's love, that God's love was displayed. But what aspect of that love gripped Paul? What is the love that Paul is getting at here? What is the part that has compassed him, that has compressed him and grabbed him, that it is controlling him, as he says? And the answer to this, in that verse, he said, it is that one died for all, therefore all died. So the love that Paul is talking about, that, is, that has compassed him, that has gripped him, that, is, that has him in his grip, it's Christ. It's Christ dying for me. It's, it's God's love. It's that all factor of God's love. That's the thing that is driving Paul. That's the love that, is, that is, has compressed Paul. It's this love. God's awesome love, he's overwhelmed with this goodness of who he is and what he has done for him. And so he is gripped by it. And for us to get a better understanding of God's love, to see the all factor of God's love, I want to show you a short video. Ole, can you cue the video? What, what, what you're seeing right now. First of all, this is the earth. Okay, then it's just, just you're taking off from the earth from Southern California, and we're gonna we're gonna rise up a little bit here. Okay, we're gonna pull away from it. We're gonna pull higher. Now this is at about 10 kilometers. Like if you climb Mount Everest, this is what you'd see. You'd see the curvature of the earth from that distance. Now you're gonna we're gonna climb up even higher. This is at a hundred kilometers. And you're a fourth of the way to the space station now. This is what you'd see. If you get to this level, you're considered an astronaut. Just if you ever get there. Okay, now we're going 100,000 kilometers. 100,000 kilometers from the Earth. You're a fourth of the way to the moon. That's what the Earth would look like. Now we're going to pull away to a million kilometers. At a million kilometers, there's the moon. Okay? There's the moon. You can barely see the Earth. You're at a million kilometers now. You're past the past the moon, and uh, now we're going to go to 100 million kilometers. 100 million kilometers, you're still not to the sun. The sun's 93 million miles away. But now we're going to go to 10 trillion kilometers. Ten, there's the sun. Okay. You just passed the sun. Now you would see all of the planets at 10 trillion kilometers. And now we're at 10 to the 15th power. That means 10 with 15 zeros. I don't know what that number is. 15 zeros, and the sun's just like a bright dot amidst other stars. And now we're going to 10 light years away. At 10 light years away, come on, let's go. Zoom, there you go. 10 light years away. Now you just see the sun with like 11 other stars that are kind of its neighbors. You know, that, 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 that's our sun. And now we're going to go 1,000 light years away. At a thousand light years away, you, you wouldn't even see our sun anymore. These are just a bunch of stars close to it in this cluster inside the Milky Way. Now we're going to zoom out even further, and that's the Milky Way we live in. See that cluster of stars? Those are about a hundred thousand stars that are closest to our sun. You can't see our sun anymore at this point. Now this is our Milky Way galaxy. Forget about the Earth. Okay, there's our Milky Way galaxy that we live in. Mm. Um, and we're just buried in there somewhere. And we're going to pull out even further, and you'll see that our galaxy is actually, it's, it's a big galaxy, and, uh, and all those other things you're seeing now are galaxies. And we're going to pull away 10 million light years now. His next scene is 10 million light years. Those are all galaxies you see amidst our Milky Way, several hundred galaxies. Now we're going to go 100 million light years away. This is the last one. We're going to zoom out to 100 million light years. Those are all clusters of galaxies. 
galaxies and clusters of galaxies. You wouldn't even see how a Milky Way galaxy anymore amidst that. We don't have telescopes that go beyond that little sphere there. Oh, man, that just puts me in the praise right there. Just looking at that. You, you, that's just as far as our telescopes will, school, will, will scope out, zoom out. But if you could ever get to God where God is, the whole universe would be like a grain of sand. The whole universe would be like a little grain of sand. And in that, in that little universe, there would be this, this, this galaxy, the Milky Way galaxy. And in that little grain of sand, if you had a microscope and you can, or just one of those lasers, you can cut that little grain of sand. You can cut that little piece off. There you would have Earth. And if you just keep cutting that little, little, little piece off, that little microscopic piece, then you're going to have us. And the scripture is saying that God loves us. This, this big God loves these, these little, little types, these, these little, little tiny specks. That this God is mindful of us and that he, that he loves us and that he, that he wants to give us his, his spirit. And, and he cares about us. When you, when you see how big God is and how, how little we are, I understand why the psalmist says in Psalms 8, 3, and 4, what is man that you are mindful of us? What is man that you even, that you think of us when I consider you, the heavens and, and the stars and the moons and the works of your hand? He, he's saying, um, what is man? Who am I, God, that you're actually thinking of me? And not only are you thinking of me, God, you actually love me? This, this little, little type, this little, little half little spot of a, uh, of a grain of sand. You're just this big God and you actually caring about how I feel and, and my life and, and me actually being with you and you're allowing your Holy Spirit to come in and live in me. Me, this little mini, mini grain of sand. You care about me. See, that, that's the all factor of God. And that's why the psalmist, he, he wrote that psalm because he realized how great God is. And I believe that's the, the aspect that's grabbing Paul when he says that the love of God constrains me. He, he recognized who it is who has died. When he said in his verse that one died for all, he, he recognized who's the one that's dying. And, and he just sees how big God is and who he is. And he's he just in love with it. He's in, he's in love with God's love of who he is. Because God is great and God is just so awesome. And, and he comes to a grip of, of what that is and it just controls him. It just grips him tight so that he just has to go and be about God's mission. God loves us. This, this little tiny grain, God is so big, but he's actually caring about us. But what is love, Right. We, we see that God loves, Paul says in the text, that Christ loved, God loved. So, so what is love? Love is an action word. Yes, love is an action word. But love is also an affection of the heart. And it's not just an action word simply on its own, but it's an affection of the heart, the seat of our most inner emotion. That's what love is. And the scripture says God loves us. Meaning that God has affections for us backed by action. That God has affections for you backed by action. And if you're wondering why, why, why are you bringing this up, Jerome? Why, why are you talking about this love thing? The reason I'm bringing this up is one, because a very thought provoking question was brought to me. But I'm also bringing this up to prepare you for the battle. What battle? The battle of this life. The battle of a difficult marriage, the battle of sickness in your body, the battle of turmoil, the battle of depression, the battle of sadness. That's why I'm telling you this so that you may be equipped for the battle. It is this love that has endured and, and moved Paul. So I believe that if it was good enough for Paul, who went everywhere writing 13 books of the New Testament, planting churches everywhere, if this love had pushed Paul to endure, and I believe as believers, we should reflect on this love. We should study this love in the scriptures. And we should know this love in our mind and most importantly in our heart. We must know this love. If that's the thing that's fueling believers to, to go forward, then we must know this love. And back to the question that I was giving. 
how do I know that God loves me? On the surface of that, you're probably thinking, that's a basic question, Jerome. What do you mean, how do I know God loves me? Hasn't this person read John 3.16? Right? For, for God so loves the world. Yes, that's right there. How do you, how do you mean you don't know that God loves you when it says right there in the scripture that God so loved the world? But what this person is getting at is actually more deeper than what we're thinking. This person meant, how do I know that God loves me specifically? individually, not in a general sense, John 3, 16, but how do I know that God loves me, Jerome Wade? How do you know that God loves you, Pastor Brian? How do you know that God loves you, Debbie, my wife? How do you know that God loves you in a specific individual way? How do I know that God loves me? And so that was the thought-provoking question that was posed to me. And that's a good question. Because yes, we know in an objective sense, in an objective sense, yes, I know that God loves me because he sent his son to die and to to bring me to him. But the question is, how can I take this general love that I read in the scripture that God loves me, that God loves the church? How do I take this general love up here and how can I bring it closer to home to me? And so that that is what we're going to dig in and that is what we're going to see today. And I believe that Paul helps us to address this question in Romans 5 5. And so if you can't, let's go to Romans 5. And I I would love to just jump right into Romans 5 5, but I don't believe you can, you can really understand Romans 5, 5 without understanding Romans 1 through 4. And so I'm going to kind of go through just to kind of bring us up to speed to where we're at. And then we can really dig into Romans 5, 5. So we all hear Romans. We're going to start in Romans chapter 5. We're going to read verses 1 through 5 and kind of come back. And our, our main text, though, is Romans 5, 5. So we can see how do we answer this question? How do I know that God loves me specifically, individually? So Romans 5, verse 1, therefore, having been justified, made right by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have obtained our introduction by faith and to this grace in which we stand. And we exalt in hope of the glory of God. And not only this, but we also exalt in our tribulations knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance and perseverance, proving character and proving character, hope and verse five and hope does not disappoint or your text may say, make a shame because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy spirit who has been given to us. The Holy spirit which has been given to us. If if you have a Bible, which I'm sure you all do, many of your texts will say for the heading of this chapter, it will say the results of justification. That's what mine says. It says the results of justification. Because here in this chapter, Paul is describing how a person is justified before Christ, before God. And justification is just a fancy word, meaning how does a person or how is a person made right with God? Or how does a person stand righteous before God? Or how does a person stand uncondemned before God? So he's showing here in this text that justification is a gift from God by a way of his grace in the sending of his son to bear our sins. And because of that, we can now have peace with God. So he's describing to us what justification is. He describes it as a gift. And he, he describes it as God's grace. And so as you keep going in the text, he now describes and shows us how do we actually access this, this grace. And he says that we access this grace through faith in Jesus. Are we all seeing that? How we access this grace through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand. So Paul is showing that justification is a gift by God's grace. It is not through works or anything earned. And he's showing that we enter into this grace 
by faith in Jesus Christ. And now as a result of us having our sins, our debt paid, Paul says that we can now exalt. What does he say? He says that we can now exalt or, or boast in this hope of the glory of God. Are we seeing that in verse 2? Now that we have this grace, now that we have entered into this grace by faith in Jesus, he says that we exalt in hope of the glory of God. That word exalt means I can boast now. I can rejoice in the glory of God. He said I can rejoice in the glory of God or in hope of the glory of God. But some of you, as, you, as you're reading this test, you're saying, okay, Brother Jerome, I see what you're saying, but Paul is saying that he's exalting in hope of the glory of God. And how, how do you boast in hope? Hope is not something that's guaranteed, right? Because when, when we use the word hope in our context, hope means what? Uncertainty. I'm hoping something will happen good. I'm hoping this will happen. Hope is really uncertain when we use it here in this world, in, in, in our society. But you must understand when you see hope in the scriptures, there is no uncertainty. That is a confident assurance. That is a confident knowing that God is going to do what he says. So when you see this hope in the scripture, Paul is not doubting. He's not wondering if he's going to rejoice and exalt in the hope of the glory of God. He is confident he is knows he is for sure that this glory he is going to be a part of so this when you see this hope here it is not an uncertainty it is confidence that i will be a part or know the glory of god and so, so why is he so excited about this, this hope of the glory of God? What is it that is so big that he said that he exalts in the hope of the glory of God? The reason Paul is so excited about this hope is because his hope was once lost. This hope that he's excited about was once lost. Romans 3.23 says what? That all have sinned and what? Come on, brother um, Eduardo. And fall short of what? The glory of God. So the glory of God that he is now hoping in and exalting in, that glory was once lost. And so now he's excited because it's now found. See, when we had sinned, that sin had brought about a separation between us and God. So we were separated from the most glorious thing, which is God. That's, that's what Romans 3.23 means. Because we were separated from the most glorious thing, we were missing the most glorious thing, which is God. Because there is nothing more valuable than God. There is nothing more glorious than God. And if your sin has separated you, you are now separated from the glory and goodness of God. And so Paul is showing here that I can now ex exalt and rejoice because this glory that I had once lost, I was once headed for eternal separation from God, away from God's presence, away from God's glory. Now I can regain it. Now I can have it. And so he is, he's rejoicing in that. He's rejoicing that now he gets the prize. The prize is God. God is the glory. That was the thing that he was separated from. And so now that he knows he's going to get it, he's excited that now I get the prize. The prize is God. That is why in 1 Peter 3.18, Peter says that Christ died for sins once, the just for the unjust. What was the purpose? That he might bring us to God. That was the purpose. It was the just dying for the unjust. What was his purpose in dying? Taking care of our sins so that he might bring us who? To God. Because God is the prize. God is the gift. The hope is to be with God forever. To see him how he really is. To be with him in eternity. That is why John Piper, and some of the brothers know I'm reading the book, God is the Gospel. That's why he writes the book, God is the Gospel. Because God is the prize. You got to understand this because if you don't understand that God is the ultimate treasure, that he is the prize, that he is the thing that we get, you can easily go out and preach a man-centered gospel. If you're not preaching it as God as the prize, you can easily go out and preach, come to Jesus because you're going to get all of these other great things. You can get help. You can get wealth. You can get all of these great things. See, that's preaching a man-centered gospel. You're not preaching, hey, you get the prize. You get God. You get the most valuable thing in this world. There's nothing more valuable than God. And, and through Jesus, you can get the prize. 
So that is the gospel. God is the gospel. He is the gift. He is the prize. See, if, if, if God is not in heaven, then the heaven is not even heaven. Even if heaven was a place or is a place, what well, is a place, even if heaven is a place that is free from sin, even if heaven is a place that is free from disease, stress, worry, it's free from mosquitoes and roaches. I can't stand roaches. So even as a pl- heaven is a place like that, guess what? If God is not there, it's not heaven. Even if it's this utopia, if God is not there, it's not heaven. Why? Because God is the prize. He's the one we get. So we got to understand our hope is just not to abort our, our flesh from getting burnt by hell's flames. Yes, we care about people dying in sins, but we also want to tell them, here you get the prize, which is God. So we're not preaching good news just from hell. We're preaching that you get God's glory. You get the prize. You get to be with him. What was lost now, you can have. That's the gospel. That is the hope. That is the thing that Paul is describing when he says hope. That's what he's getting at. That's why he's exalting in that hope, because now he gets the prize. He gets the most valuable thing, which is God. And so he says, I can boast in that. He's exalting in that. He's exalting in hope of the glory of God. But then now in verse three, he says, and not only am I boasting in hope of the glory of God, look what he says in verse three. He says, not only is this, but we also exalt in our tribulations, and he describes that how tribulations brings perseverance, and perseverance proven character, and proven character produces hope. So in verses 3 to 4, Paul, by the way of the Holy Spirit, is anticipating the various trials that believers will face. And he shows them how their tribulation actually pushes them closer to their hope, which is God or being where he is. But now we get to the, the part that what I really want to get to now as we kind of went through those few verses. We can dig in those another day, but I, I want to get to five. So now we get to this, this part that really helps us to, to answer, I believe, our question in verse five. How do I know that God loves me? And not just me in a general sense. How do I know he loves me specifically? So let's look at verse five and let's read it again. And it says, hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit, which was given to us. So in here in verse 5, Paul is now showing why that in the midst of trials, the believers can endure it and not lose their hope and not be ashamed of their hope. And Paul is even so bold in this verse to say that, that the believer can actually rejoice in the trial. Now, please understand, I'm just a messenger here because I'm not at a point where I'm always rejoicing in my trials. I hope they get there, but I'm not at this point where, well, like where Paul is saying, where in every trial, I'm just rejoicing. So, so please understand, I'm just a messenger when I, when I read verse five, I'm just presenting God's truth to you. And I pray that it works in you as it is working in me, but, uh, I'm just a messenger. But here's the question that we want to answer. How does this hope during the trial show us that God loves us individually, specifically? And what is this hope all about? And what we see that this rejoicing in our trial, which is hope, is actually the answer to our question. How do I know that God loves me specifically? And the reason that's the answer or the reason that we can find our answer is is because in verse five, he says, The love of God has been poured out within our hearts by the Holy Spirit, which has been given to us. So in this text, Paul is showing us that this love of God that we don't that we want to know if we have or not, or the reason that we can have this, this hope during trials of tribulation. The reason that we can have this is because of the Holy Spirit or the possession of the Holy Spirit. Let me explain what I mean, because some of you are like, hold on, I'm not fully understanding what you mean. See, the Holy Spirit does several things to show us or to show the individual that they are specifically loved by God. The Holy Spirit does several things to show the individual that they are specifically loved by God. And let me just list a few off. One, the Holy Spirit provides an internal witness of God's love 
for the individual. That's one. The Holy Spirit provides an internal, internal witness of God's love for the individual. We're going to come back and look at that. The Holy Spirit also confirms our adoption as children of God who are therefore loved of God. Verse um, number three, the spirit also provides an external witness that we are children of God and therefore loved of God. So those are the three we're going to look at, how the Holy Spirit provides an internal witness that I am a, that I am loved of God individually. The Holy Spirit confirms our adoption as children of God, and we are therefore loved of God. And the Holy Spirit provides an external witness that we are children of God and therefore loved of God. So let's look at the first one. The internal testimony or the internal witness that I am loved of God, that God loves me. So in verse five, Paul says that God's love is poured out in our hearts. God's love is poured out, poured like a bucket, poured out in our hearts. And this love that we're talking about here is God's love for us. Not our love for God because we love him because he first loved us. So this is God's love for us. His love is poured out in our hearts. That's what this text is telling us. And what is his love? We looked at it when we first started. How did Paul describe this love? Paul described this love, remember in 2 Corinthians 5, 14 and 15, as Jesus dying for all. That was the love, remember, that had endured him, that had pushed him. That was the love that had gripped Paul. It was him recognizing this all-powerful God coming down and dying for all. That had gripped him and that had moved him. We also know in John 3, 16 that Jesus talks about the love of God being through the giving of his son. And also I want to show you, um, go to 1 John 4. Go to 1 John 4. We're just making sure we're lining our loves up right when he says that the love of God is poured out in our hearts. Let's make sure we line this up. So we see what Paul, how Paul describes God's love. He says in Christ dying, one person dying for all. John 3, 16. Jesus said, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And then I want you to look at 1 John 4, 9 through 10. Are we all here? All right. Let's read. It says, verse 9, By this love, or by this, the love of God was manifested in us that God has sent his only begotten son into the world so that we might live through him. 10. And this is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. The propitiation sacrifice for our sins. So I want you to think about something we just looked at. If you look at Paul's description of God's love, you look at Jesus' description of God's love in John 3.16, and you look at here in 1 John's description of love, you can't define God's love without mentioning the sending of his son, Jesus. If you had to define God's love, if you needed a a Webster dictionary, it's going to say, please define God's love. You're going to define it by God sending his son to die in the place of sinners. That is the thing that grips Paul. That is the thing that Jesus preached. That is what John is saying right here. It is God sending his son. That is how he's defining this love. And, and, and let me say this, brothers and sisters, I, I got to give this, this thought out here. If you have never come to the understanding of the large gap of separation between you and God because of your sins, then this love that we're talking about here, guess what? It's going to make no sense to you. It's going to make no sense to you. I, I'm, just, I'm just throwing words to you. If, you. if you have not come to this understanding, this love that Paul is talking about and, and what Jesus is talking about and what John is talking about, if you have not come to the understanding of this large gap of separation between you and God and your unredeemed state, if you don't understand that, then what I'm saying here about God's love is just words. It, it's not going to have any effect on you. And I kind of explain it like this. Imagine... If you had a garden, imagine if you had a garden and in that garden there you had you had a a nice plant. And let's say you you went to that plant that was in your garden and you cut that plant in half and you left half of the plant 
in the ground, in the root, and you took the other half with you. And let's say you had a really high-tech spaceship, and you were able to take that plant, that other half that you have with you, and let's say you were able to fly to Pluto or Mars or wherever planet you want to go. Let's say you had a high-tech spaceship, and you can go to one of those faraway planets. Let's say you went to one of those faraway planets, and then you, you, you dropped that plant that you brought with you, and you dropped it there. What would happen to that plant? It would die. That plant, it would die. Why? Because it is so far away from the root, its source. It is so far from its source, which is the root, that it's just going to die. That is what, that is a picture of us because of our sin. When we sinned that what we were born into, we are, we were so far away from God, the root, that we were considered spiritually dead. That is, that's the same picture of us. And that is why um, in, in our life, when we, we were, before we knew Christ, you had so many unfulfilled desires. You had so many unfulfilled satisfaction. Why? It's because you were separated from the root, just like that plant. So, so many people, because they didn't have that satisfaction of God, because they were so far separated from the root, they ran to drugs. Many people ran to alcoholism. Many people ran to multiple partners. Many people ran and immersed themselves in, in work and success. And some of us, we, we ran to uh, our spouses looking for that satisfaction. And when that spouse didn't provide that satisfaction that only God can provide, we went and tried to get another spouse. See, we, we were doing those things because we were far away from our root, the source, the source of our satisfaction. And because of that, we were looking in all these other places, looking for that satisfaction. But God, as opposed to letting us stay in that unfulfilled state, interjects himself into our creation and sends us grace. And he sends Jesus, who now brings us to our satisfaction. He brings us to the root where we can now find our fulfillment of joy. That is the love of God. That is the love of God. And guess what? It is that love that Paul is saying in Romans 5 that the Holy Spirit is now dumping in our heart. See, Romans 5 is showing that this general love of God loves the world, that God loves the church. The Holy Spirit is now taking that general love and he's now dumping it and bringing it now personal close to home. And he's dumping that love into our spirit that we may not just know it intellectually, but that we may experience it and have this love inside of us. And so Paul is showing it is this love that the Holy Spirit is giving and why the believer during their trials and tribulation, they don't lose hope because the Holy Spirit has now brought God's love into their heart that they are confident even in the midst of the trial. See, the Holy Spirit, he's the one that is doing the work to show us that God does love us. He's taking that general thing up here, that general love, and now he's bringing it all the way down to your heart that you may come to know God, may know his love, may feel his love, may feel his presence. See, that is the work of the Holy Spirit, and that is what Paul is describing here in 5.5. 5. He's pouring God's love, he said, in our hearts. That love of what he has done for us, He's pouring it into our hearts so that we now understand it. And now that we, we see Jesus and we love him for it, that's the work of the Holy Spirit. And that is what was happening to, to Paul and, and the countless martyrs that died in history. God, through the Holy Spirit, brought that love in their heart, and so they were ready to endure anything. Because the Holy Spirit made them aware that they are loved of God, that God loves them. He brought that general love he brought it all the way internal, close to home, so that we may know that I'm loved of God. So the Holy Spirit confirms it in our heart that we are loved to God, and we in turn love God. So without the Holy Spirit doing that, we won't even love God. He brings it down to our hearts so that we can now love the one who first loved us. So that's one. That's the internal testimony that the Holy Spirit brings what Paul is describing and how the believers were able to rejoice in their tribulations, why they didn't lose their hope because of what the Holy Spirit had already poured out in their hearts. So the, the second way is that the Spirit confirms our adoption into God's family. Go to Romans 8. Romans 8. Uh, 
And we're going to look at verse 14 through 16. Let's see how else we come to know that we're loved of God individually, specifically, and how it's through the Holy Spirit. He says, Paul, again, he says, for all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are what? The children of God. So those who are being led by the Spirit of God, who possess the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God, the children of God. 15 says, for you have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you have received a spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry out, Abba, Father, meaning Daddy. We're calling God Daddy. 16, the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are, what, children of God. If we are children of God, we're God's children. We know that we're loved of God. So Paul is showing us here how the spirit, it confirms in our spirit. It, it communicates with our spirit and confirms it that we have been adopted into the family of God. And he moves into us so much so that God begins to be our father. When he says we call him daddy. It's like when Serenity calls me daddy. That's a term of endearment. We're calling God Father. And see, the reason that he, he uses the term Father here is because when you, when you use the term Father, you're saying several things. You're saying that this person is knowable. So he's saying that God is knowable. He's not some impersonal force, but he's personal and he's knowable. When you, when you say God is, is Father, you're saying that God is a protector. You're saying that God provides guidance. You're saying that God provides my need. So all of these things, we're saying this about God. And that only comes through the work of the Holy Spirit confirming that we are his children. So the Spirit confirms it with our spirit that we have been adopted into God's family. And he, and he works in us by us having an affection for God and looking to God for guidance and for all the different things of this life. So that is the work of the Spirit confirming it inside of us that we are children of God. And if therefore children of God, we know we are loved of God because God loves his children if he's the greatest and best father. So again, the spirit here, he shows us how we are individually loved of God because we are now his children. And the third one is the external testimony of the Holy Spirit. And the scripture that I base that off is Ezekiel, Ezekiel 36, 27. We went there a few weeks ago. Um, but just to summarize it, in Ezekiel 20, 36, 27, God promises to give his Holy Spirit in us. And he says that Holy Spirit is going to cause us to walk in his statutes. He says that the Holy Spirit is going to cause us, work in us, to walk in God's statutes. You also have Titus 3, 5, and 6, where the Holy Spirit is speaking in a role as washing and rejuvenating and, and making us new. So based on Ezekiel 36 and Titus 3 and 5, we see that we know that we have this Holy Spirit in us, which God only gives to his children when we begin to love and do the things that God loves and God transforms our heart. Let me explain to you my own personal testimony. Sometimes throughout my life, the enemy comes and throws darts where I begin to doubt God's love, where I begin to doubt different things or whatever he's, he's trying to get me to doubt. But in the midst of that doubt, what I do is I look back on my past and I look where God has brought me from. I look at how I used to think and I look at how I'm thinking now. I look at what my heart's desire used to be after and now I look at what my heart's desire are after now and I know from reading the scripture that, that that only happens by a work of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So I'm, I'm seeing that, hold on, you're telling me that God doesn't love me but I'm seeing God's work all in my life. I'm seeing the change of who I used to be and who I am now so I reflect on what God has done for me and I know that was the work of the Holy Spirit and it's only his children who received the Holy Spirit so I know that I am loved of God if I'm his child. And that is something that we have to do. See, it's, it's kind of like an artist. Imagine if you had an artist who, who, who was drawing and he was having a bad day. Let's say he was having a bad day when he was drawing. And, and, and the enemy began to tell him, oh, you're just a horrible artist. You can't draw. Look at this work. This is horrible. What that artist can do, that artist can go and look in his portfolio 
He can go and look at all the beautiful artwork that he has made and he can see that, no, I'm not a bad artist. Look at the things that I'm doing. Look at the things that I have done. That is the same with the believer when the enemy comes and tells you that you are not God's child, that you're not loved. You look and you see the work of God on your heart. You work and you look and you see what God has done in you and you use that to say, no, I am loved of God individually and specifically. Why? Because I see the work of of his Holy Spirit externally in my life. So it is in these things that we have to remember that we are specifically and individually loved by God. I can reflect on these things. So think about that. Reflect on God's love. Reflect on his love in Christ and how you were once separated from God, but now you are found that now his love is in you. You must reflect on the change that God has brought about in your life. That's how you know that God loves me specifically and individually. And what else you must see? Do I love Jesus? Because the thing that the Holy Spirit does is it glorifies Christ. So do you have a desire to glorify Christ? Is Christ glorified in your life? If that's the case, then you see the work of God on your life and you know that I'm individually and specifically loved by God. And you got to understand, believers, with this life, it's ups and downs. There's times when we're seeing God clearly and we know God loves us. And there's times when we're not seeing so clearly. And we're feeling like God does not, does not love me and I'm here alone. It's in these moments you have to reflect on these things of Scripture to remind yourself, I am specifically, individually loved by God. I see his work on my heart. I see his work in my lifestyle. I see how he has changed my minds and my habits. I know that's a work of the Holy Spirit and only those, his children, receive the Spirit. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, Lord God, we thank you for sending your Spirit as a internal testimony, an internal witness of your love for us. We thank you for bringing your love all the way down to our hearts and encountering our spirits so that we know that we are your children, even when the enemy comes to tell us we're not. God, I pray that you open the eyes of the hearts of my brothers and sisters, that they may come and know your love even more, Holy Spirit. Bring the knowledge of who Jesus is and his love to their hearts that they may endure, that they may go forward unashamed, that they may reflect on your love as trials come, that they may reflect on your goodness to them. God, I pray that you keep and hold my brothers and sisters. God, minister to them. Let them, let them feel and know your presence by the working of your Holy Spirit. God, it's you that we thank you are the prize, God. I pray that you bring that thought and idea to my brothers and sisters. God, that you are the prize. You are the gift. You are the good thing. And that they can rest confidently in that hope of being with you in glory. So, God, we thank you. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.